Right, good morning everybody, fresh out the river. Um, I brought the objects outside, got a little makeshift table here. Got a pot of tea to keep me um, warm my bones up. I've laid out some of the larger objects um, to go through. We've got the small objects in there and we'll go through them in a few moments. Got some great footage on the GoPro, which we'll download. Got a cat walking by. Good morning. And um, if you hear a lot of bird song, please forgive uh, forgive me. It's quite quite nice actually. Live on the nature on the edge of a nature reserve, and at this time of year, all of the birds seem quite tit, um, twitter pated. So okay, so I'm going to make a start. This is. Um, the one that is I'm going to talk about first it's clearly uh, a very impressive find I recognized it instantly what it was incredibly this is the very first one I found in Durham so I'm very excited by that I've got a very short shank there nice curved arms coming down a broken terminal there an intact terminal there and what looks like a, a buckle attached on there so what you're looking at is a rowel spur. Now this type was dated to the 14th, early 15th century. Um, given the level of preservation there of the metalwork, I'm thinking this is a, a sort of a brass one rather than an iron. Although there's very little oxygen, it's come from this anaerobic layer in the riverbed. Um, so there's very little corrosion. Uh, it does have some concretion on, but when we get that into the lab in the Department of Archaeology, do some air abrasion, clean it up. You might make out a little groove in there, and that pretty much tells us exactly what it is. Um, so it's got some concretion in there, but you can just imagine um, that that is the place where the rowel sat. So this circular little device that might have had six to perhaps 12 little spikes on, it would have spun round uh, and dug into the horse. Um, that short shank there, that relatively short shank and the angle or the curvature of that of the arms is important because it will help us date it very accurately. The buckle is circular in form, it's filled with concretion but when we clean that out it will probably reveal a central bar and maybe an iron pin intact. Maybe this uh, Raoul Spur was um, destroyed or thrown away because it was damaged. So unrepairable, you just throw it away. So you can just imagine uh, fitting right into the heel of uh, a man, perhaps dressed in armour, um, a knight or a soldier. Um, wonderful object, clearly a museum quality. And I'm delighted. Uh, that is probably one of the two objects that we will um, fully research and hopefully get on display into a museum. Okay, so before I tip the objects out, oops, I just want to go through uh, these objects. And we've got um, a few spikes, wall spikes, wall mounted brackets that came out of the river. That one there would have had a circular hole in. Um, this object's of real interest. It's an iron bar. Um, you can just see it's would have tapered down like that in a similar one there. It's quite thin. It's got a lead plug on this end. So you can see a bit of concretion just dropping off. So we know that uh, Elvet Bridge itself was built uh, at the end of the 12th century by Bishop Hugh de Pusset. Um, so it's a, 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 a basically a late medieval bridge. The bridge itself was manufactured by stonemasons. Uh, plumbers and pewters would have been engaged. So you can just imagine if you were a stonemason and you're putting together, knitting together two large blocks which form part of the structure of the bridge. You would uh, pre-drill or pre-manufacture chisel two holes out or two plugs. You'd get this iron bar um, with tapered edges, little edges coming down and under tension you would perhaps drop that into the hole, tap it down pour in these plugs of lead um, and that would have expanded the bar and then as it cooled it would have sort of contracted and helped knit the big blocks together so it doesn't look very much but this tells us a great deal about the techniques the manufacturing techniques for the manufacture of Elvet Bridge so 
This is probably 12th century in, in date. Um, this Raoul Spur is probably 14th, 15th century in date. So a nice little context here of dating for the objects. Okay, so before I tip this out, I just um, a couple of nice things I've placed on the top that I found right towards the end of the dive. This is a, a nice little rotary key, probably got, made of iron, nice long shank there. Um, and the teeth of the key appear to be splayed. It's got a little bit of concretion on there, but again, that dates it to that late medieval period, so 14th, 15th century key there. Um, this, this is the object that I found, almost the last thing I found this morning. Um, clearly it's quite special. The level of preservation on this um, could actually fool you to thinking that this is not that old, but this is 13th or 14th century in date. Um, it is a belt chip. It's the first one I've found of this type. It's really well decorated. A series of little trefoils in there, a bit of open work. There's a little square area there with a letter in. That's interesting. That's a black letter. And expect Lombardic script from that period, but no, this, this is uh, a black letter, perhaps an A, a black letter A. I don't know if you can just make that out. A um, little rectangular recess in there, and that tells us what its function is really. So a leather strap, leather belt would have gone, been pushed into there. So this is the belt, the terminal or the belt buckle if you wish. Um, that really narrow bar there is where the iron, perhaps almost certainly an iron pin would have sat. So very delicate object, a little bit of a belt push through there, uh, belt push, the other bit of the belt push through there, and um, fastened by the iron plate. And um, there's a little bit of wear on this object here. So perhaps two rivets held in place the, the leather strap. Um, but there's a bit of wear and tear on that one there, and which has subsequently damaged the black letter A on that side. But this is um, a delicate object, almost certainly worn by a lady. Um, oh wow, look at that. I don't know if you can make that out, but there's some very fine glitter on there, almost gold. So possibly this object was gilded. So you can just imagine, that's a very decorative, very feminine little piece of work. A lady with the initials A, Annabelle. Um, that again is museum quality. That might be one of the, the two objects uh, that we go on to research fully. So I'm delighted with that one. Um, I'll just bring this one out. This is uh, again another decorative mount. You can see it's a nice little pattern on there. But it's, what you're looking at is a very thin sheet of brass um, that's been perhaps cut, pre-cut to shape, but then machine pressed. Um, and what I can see is one, two, three little holes where it's been um, secured to perhaps a casket or a box, or even a coffin. This might be coffin decoration. It's very lightweight, so it lends itself to that. Not given its manufacturing technique, I'm thinking that one's uh, post medieval day, perhaps 17th, 18th century for that one. Right, so let's get our objects out. There's nothing. So I haven't seen these since they came out of the river. Bloody um, river water running all over. Self dry. Okay, so what you're looking at are all of this morning's finds. So I'm quickly look, just look through, see what we've got. Now you might be thinking, "Wow, that's a lot of finds," um, and it is. Maybe over 200 objects here, and that is. Not a surprise, um, any given dive at Durham we will find between 150 and 250 objects. So this is a typical find, um, set of finds, it's the what I class as, uh, if I can quote uh, James Dietz, it's the small things forgotten. 
and on this case the tiny things forgotten. Uh, the everyday material culture of the citizens of Durham for the last 800 years. So it's very rare I find anything that predates Elvert Bridge. So what I'm going to quickly do is just take out all of the casting waste, the bits of lead that um, have been thrown in, something's been manufactured um, and a bit of lead's been cut off or slopped over the sides and it's very common to find huge quantities of this casting waste. You've got absolutely kilograms of this stuff. Right, okay, and so I've got a better feel for what, what I've got here. And some spikes and nails. Put them together. Right. Okay, so what we have is some incredible small finds. I recognize many of them instantly. And um, got some cloth seals, a spindle wall, a window came, got a coin in there, crude buckle, pins, got loads and loads of pins. Um, it's not uncommon to find so many pins in the river. Got over 2,000 from Durham. Uh, and these are all brass pins, wire drawn brass pins. Um, I'm very lucky, um, during my time at Durham University, my supervisor was Dr. Chris Capel, and Chris um, actually did his thesis on pins, and he developed a typology, uh, which is still used today by many academics, um, type A, B, C, D, pins. Um, so he studied late medieval pins, but what I know from the pins that we found in Durham is, they're all brass, they're wire drawn, with a twisted wire head, they once were all covered in, in tin, so they, they would have looked like modern day pins, but uh, there's a chemical, an acid perhaps in the river, an alka, um, that's worn away the tin and just left us with these brass, brass ones. Quite often we'll find these long pins, which are suggestive of the use in a, perhaps a lady's headdress. It was not uncommon to have up to 20 pins uh, in your headdress. Um, these very smaller, finer ones, as technology developed, they would be put into, um, they, they be, were able to manufacture them smaller. Given that there was drapers and tailors engaged um, in Riverside workshops down at Elvet, perhaps these were used in, these smaller ones were used in the drapery trade and the manufacture of clothing. Okay, so what we've got is a couple of um, lead trade weights or pan weights. Strangely, that one has a hole in, and got a lot of lead trade weights from the river. That's a nice little object. It's a um, spindle wall. This one's made of lead, it's smooth. Quite often we'll get them decorated. So it's sort of discoidal in shape, and got some concretion in the middle. So this, spin, this wall would have um, just sat at the bottom of a spindle, and when it was spun, the spindle, which uh, was attached via the wool to a distaff would have been used to spin yarn. Uh, we know that we weavers were uh, engaged in Durham. Uh, evidence of weaving actually can be found in these two yeah, objects. So what you're looking at here are little lead cloth seals. So in England from the time of Edward III if you were a weaver of cloth, you were not allowed to sell it unless it had been inspected first by a crown appointed official. They were known as alnagers, and an alnager had the power of entry. They could come into your home uh, to inspect the cloth. They would measure, the, calculate its length, its width, um, and indeed its weight. If it was too short, if it didn't conform to the statute, they would actually seize it, so they were very unpopular. In addition, they would attach a little lead cloth seal like this um, and that proved that a subsidy um, and a tax had been paid. Usually it was four pence per broadcloth. So I know a lot about these um, because I did my thesis on lead cloth seals um, and these two bring the total found in Durham up to um, 315. So these are really wonderful uh, additions to the collection at Durham. These are relatively small, so I, I'm suspecting these are 16th century. And this one in particular, they are both two-part lead cloth seals. Um, 
So the way I classified them, uh, indeed Jeff Egan did, is this is um, disc one. There's a very small interconnecting strip and between the two discs, you might just make out there, uh, there's almost certainly textile. We get a lot of textile surviving at Durham. So on disc two, um, is a in this case it's a merchant's mark. Um, on this one you can see how the rivet has been pushed through and flattened down. You can't really make it out on that particular one. So we've got a beaded circular border with this uh, merchant's mark in the middle with some initials I and B either side of it. I we know stands for John, uh, sorry for J. <laughs> and so for, for example John, so John Brown or, or John Bankhead seriously doubt that um, and in the middle we have this unusual series or combination of letters uh, at the top we have the sort of an inverted four or, or a flipped over number four I'm not sure what that means it's uh, maybe linked to the paschal lamb or the lamb of god but below that we have a letter o in between a h and an n and that vertical column there is probably an i which we know as a j so we have ha, j o H N John, so that is somebody called John John Brown, um, his cloth seal. So, um, not only would we get cloth seals affixed to cloth by um, an Alnage official, or um, but we also got uh, weavers had to do it. Later, crown statutes required that fullers and dyers had to do it. Um, you would get guild appointed wardens and searchers inspecting the, the workmanship of their guild members as well affixing their seals so it was wasn't uncommon for a, a finished bolt of cloth to have maybe half a dozen of these little seals on and it was evidence of you know the manufacture the trade inspection uh, and taxation of commercially produced cloth in England from that right through that late medieval um, to all the way through to 1728 on this one, it's got two initials, R and E, or R and F, and some numbers above it. There's a five, an eight, and a four there. And if there's a little, there is, there's a little foot of a number there. So possibly this has got the date 1584. So that confirms that it's a 16th century lead cloth seal, um, which is typical of this size cloth seals. So two wonderful additions to, um, the largest collection of late and post-medieval cloth seals available for analysis outside of London. So you can just imagine how important that collection is. Oh, and there's a nice little object. Um, yep, I love finding these. What you're looking at here is, um, you might just make out, it's a square. There's nothing on that side, uh, but there is something on this side. So it's a uni-face coin weight. Uh, this particular one will be made of brass and I don't know if you can just make out but it's got like a little circle on there with a knightly or saintly figure on so there's a man standing he's got a halo and some wings and he's got a long spear going down there and he's probably trampling um, a dragon so it's not from Game of Thrones it's uh, <laughs> from uh, it's our very own Saint George so coin weights were used during that l late medieval period um, to check that gold coins hadn't been clipped. So if you were a merchant engaged in procurement of uh, goods and you're being paid in gold, you'd have a little balance set up. You'd put these coin weights in one side, uh, in one, one of the balances, um, and your gold coins in the, in the other, and you would ensure um, the gold coin hadn't been clipped you're getting your true value of gold and um, so Saint George um, in this angel form would have been used in England to measure uh, gold angel coins that's what they were uh, Saint George was associated with so I'll we'll probably date that one to 1550 1580 that sort of period so wonderful little addition to our coin weight collection uh, this is the coin <laughs> I thought this was a modern, well, a relatively modern half penny, but uh, it's unusual. It's got a crown at the top. I don't know if you can make that out. Uh, underneath it says half farthing, 1844. So half farthing, 1844. And there she is, uh, a young Queen Victoria, almost like a bunhead bust. 
So look, first one I found of that type, half farthing. Um, right, just show you these objects. I love these. There's one there. Has got any more? There's one. Right, these are lead. These are all lead, these objects, uh, and the casting waste from the manufacture of window cam, lead window cam. So this little bit here and that one, you can see it's got a nice straight cut. But if you can imagine, if you were a pewterer or a glazier manufacturing glass, very thin glass, you can see how thin it was there. You would want to make your window cam um, in these long, sort of lines coming off here um, these varied in length obviously glass was very expensive in medieval uh, England that's confirmed by the very thinness there we have Durham Cathedral with dozens and dozens of stained glass windows in um, but this perhaps was quite possibly used in a domestic setting um, but not every house had windows it was so expensive so you can just imagine loads of these little window uh, these cams running down quite long cut them off, go and sell your window cam um, and this casting waste was, why it was never reused or remelted I don't know. Um, what else have we got? Twisted loops there. These are um, sort of dress accessories, I guess, twisted wire loops, C copper alloy, um, with a nice little twist in there. Not 100% sure of the function, perhaps they were fasteners. Uh, I know several of these, or oh, hundreds of these have been found in um, graves uh, down the side of corpses, suggesting they were hurriedly, hurriedly buried um, and maybe just fastened with these little loops somehow. They're found in every archaeological site in, 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 in England. Um, little tacks. Um, mounts are very, very common. You just see them there. More pins. That's a nice little buckle. It's an unusual buckle. I haven't seen that saw before. Actually, oh yes, I can't believe that. I thought this was a buckle when I found it, uh, but in the sunlight, we've just revealed for the very first time that it is a pilgrim badge because, I don't know if you can make this out, there's a very small mitered head in there. So a mitre being the headdress of a bishop, um, this particular bishop in this circular form like that. Nice casting um, mold flashing there. Made in a two part mold perhaps. This is a pilgrim badge dated to the 14th, 13th to 14th century. Um, material culture evidence of pilgrimage to the shrine of Thomas a Becket of Canterbury. So that's a really, really nice uh, little object there. But what's it doing in Durham? What a great mystery. This is the first pilgrim badge of this type I found in Durham associated with Thomas a Becket. So we know Thomas a Becket was martyred in uh, 1171. He had a bit of an argument with uh, Henry II, who at one time they were great friends, but they sort of fell out. Um, some knights of Henry, friends of Henry, essentially killed Thomas in Canterbury Cathedral. Um, and during the 13th and 14th century, it became probably the, the most important shrine in its site in England, um, superseding St. Cuthbert of Durham. If you were a pilgrim, you would go to on this great journey, on this great pilgrimage, and you would buy a souvenir of that journey, and that's what this is. Um, and I believe, and this is this this is evidence of um, for me, it's, it strengthens the argument for this deliberate disposition into a watery context of something uh, for superstitious reasons. So if you were a pilgrim wearing this little badge and you'd been on this huge journey, perhaps from Durham down to Canterbury, the bottom of England, and you, were, and you made it back to Durham, you'd be so pleased. 
uh, you would throw this into the river as a thank offering for that safe um, journey home. Um, and this strengthens the argument. This, without a shadow of doubt, this is museum quality. It will go into either uh, the Museum of Archaeology at Palace Green Library or possibly uh, going to Durham Cathedral to uh, the Open Treasures, Treasures exhibition. So incredible, wow, fantastic little object. Delighted with that one. Um, quick look, what else we got? Animal teeth, uh, tooth, perhaps a cow. Um, these spikes here, uh, this one in particular, is probably um, a flax comb spike. This um, flax rather than a wool comb because of this rectangular section. Um, so you'd just imagine you'd have several of these in a wooden handle and you would comb it through the flax. Um, the more rounded ones are wood being wool comb. So if you had your raw wool or your flax, you'd have a series of these spikes and you would just comb it down just to get the, 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 the wool sort of stretched out. Um, this nice chunk of copper alloy, casting waste. Uh, quite crude so again evidence like the lead of the smelting of metal or metal working in in Elvet. the fact that it's copper alloy suggests you know buttons and buckles were being used that's a lovely little uh, lead object I'm not sure what that is it's almost like a mount a, de a decorative belt mount but it's quite large that uh, I'm not not sure what that one is um, a circular form buckle this was typical of uh, the buckles that we find um, in Durham, dated to the 12th to the 14th century, so it's circular or single loop uh, buckle, a little constriction there where a little iron pin would have gone. We have um, nearly 500 buckles now, uh, some iron washers, uh, a nut with twisted thread. That looks like you know a nut that you could use today, but in fact it's um, late medieval in date. More pins, casting waste, that's a nice little object. Not sure what that is. Uh, maybe again it's a pilgrim badge. Does that look like a crown? It might be a crown device. So it's flat on that edge. Uh, might have had a little hoot, either, it's either to dress hook an eye or a little badge. So like a secular badge, maybe or a pilgrim badge. That's very interesting actually, I'll put that one there, get that one researched. Um, a rectangular form buckle, um, a lot of concretion on, uh, it's got a central bar and that looks like an iron pin. We'll get this one aerobraded in the lab. Um, another washer, more casting waste, um, oh, nice little decorated terminal there, um, on the central hole, quite crude, made of brass, um, would have been Fasten up to something and used to turn it, perhaps. Um, got some printer's block. Uh, material there's probably antimony. Uh, Calder cloths of printers were positioned uh, just over there on Sadler Street in Durham. Um, so that's, oh, there's another one there. So each of each one of these little blocks has a has a, um, a font on it, some some sort of symbol um, used in printing, printing the books. Um, oh, there's a nice little draw handle, slightly decorated brass, very delicate little handle. Just so it's a drop leaf handle. That's that's quite special. So there you go. Um, I haven't really got time to go through everything on here. But wow, what an incredible collection of small finds. Uh, get them counted, I'm guessing there's over 200 here. Um, there's a nice little buckle uh, button, sorry, I just don't know if I've gone through this one. Um, Tudor solid cast button with integral um, shank on the bottom. Um, discoidal in shape, with a nice little nipple on the top. Again, that sort of button will date from the reign of Edward, uh, sorry, Elizabeth the first, and perhaps James the first. So, Solid cast Tudor button, we've got over 400 buttons. So, right, that's it, I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, in fact, I'm delighted with that. You, it's not your know, every day you find so many brilliant objects. Uh, so the key objects for me, are, I'm gonna select three. Obviously our Rowell Spur, 
need to get that in the lab and get that conserved as soon as possible. Um, this beautiful decorated little um, belt fitting uh, with its um, black letter A uh, and our pewter badge, our little badge probably from the reign, well certainly from the reign of Thomas the Beckett, not the reign, the, the time of Thomas the Beckett of Canterbury um, and do a bit more research on this one is that a similar sort of pilgrim badge. So there you go, um, going down, I'll get these into the lab and get them conserved is the next step. So brilliant, what an incredible day.